it's uh, great to welcome you back as we are continuing our study of the book of Romans. We're coming uh, this time to Romans chapter 5 and we're beginning, at ver uh, beginning at verse 12. So Romans chapter 5 beginning at verse 12. This is the last half of this chapter in which we find that Paul is explaining the immediate effects of the fact that we've been justified by faith. We've seen this remarkable truth spelled out by Paul in great detail that the work of Christ created a propitiatory benefit to us. That is to say that we could have imputed to us the benefits of the death of Christ. We also had imputed to us the perfection of the life of Christ. So the misery, the wrath that we deserved for the life we lived was given to Christ and He was treated accordingly. The blessing, the bliss, the goodness of what Christ deserved was given to us. This is sometimes called in Christian jargon double imputation. There's an imputation going both ways. My sinfulness was imputed to Christ and he, as Paul tells us in Galatians, became sin. And God poured out against him the curse that I deserved. At the same time, there was an imputation to me of the perfection of his life. I received the gift of righteousness, and God therefore can give to me the blessing that Christ deserved. This is the remarkable genius of the gospel, that it represents this remarkable uh, moment in which we receive these lavish benefits from God that we don't deserve and as a result of all of that we become what Paul will later call trophies or vessels of mercy. We have become the beneficiaries of this unspeakable benefit that God has poured out upon us through Christ. Well we're going to see something of that transfer, that double imputation playing out to some degree in the chapter that's before us now. Last time we looked at the fact that as a result of having been justified by faith, we have peace with God, we have access to grace, we have a hope of glory. We also have the grace we need to live through and withstand the tribulations that may sometimes come our way. Paul says not only do we uh, simply tolerate them, we rejoice in them. We rejoice in them, however, knowing that they are intended to produce great benefits. Paul himself, when he was inflicted by what he calls the thorn in the flesh, says that he came to God on several occasions praying that God would take away from him this miserable malady, whatever it might be. We don't know what it was. Paul never tells us exactly. But nevertheless, he had something that was an aggravation to him. And he came to God and asked again and again that God would remove this affliction. And of course, God answered in the negative. And he said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And he also said, my grace is sufficient for you. That's the great lesson that we all need to learn. God's grace is sufficient. And so Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, we rejoice in our afflictions. We rejoice in them. Not because we like to hurt, but because we know that these afflictions are calculated to drive us to grace. And it's grace that engenders within us patience, and that creates character, and character causes causes us to ever more deeply and profoundly rely on the hope that is set before us, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. All of this is a great expression of God's love. And of course, the latter part of the text we looked at last time was intended to drive that point home. God loved us. He poured out His love into our hearts. The objective proof of that love is that while we were still weak, while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies, God did all of these redemptive acts for us. He loved us when we were not lovely. And all of that proves, of course, that even the sufferings that may come our way are intended to create within us some deep appreciation for and conviction that God indeed loves us and that the gospel is intended to be an expression of His love as indeed it certainly is. Now this brings us to what some 
commentators regard as a bit of a parenthesis. I'm not sure that's the right word, but at this point, Paul wants to address the question, really, why is it that we are in such desperate straits? Why is it that we are plunged into such uh, circumstances of, of sin, of bondage to sin, being slaves to sin, hostility to God, enemies to Him? What is it that's created the situation where that is our lot? Why is it that we don't find some people come along who just simply have a kind of native love for God? Why is it that all of us seem to be universally trapped in this circumstance of hostility and sinfulness and guilt and so on? And that's what Paul wants to raise for us now, beginning in verse 12 of chapter 5. This is a very important text, not only in the book of Romans, but in the entire Bible. There's no text that quite approaches the subject at hand as thoroughly and definitively as this text does. It's treating a topic which is generally called in Christian theology original sin. Now I just need to point out to you the term original sin never occurs in the Bible. It's like the term Trinity. We never find the word Trinity in the Bible. We certainly find the teaching of Trinity we find clearly that God is three and one. We find there's a monotheism in, in the Bible, and yet at the same time, there's a clear affirmation of the deity of the person of uh, Christ and the deity of the person of the Holy Spirit. And they are distinguished while not separated from the Father, and hence we come up with this classical doctrine the church has subscribed to throughout the centuries of Trinity. Well, original sin is something like that. It's a theological term, a phrase, which is used to describe what seems to be a clear teaching of the Bible. And that teaching of the Bible comes down to this, that we all have within us, inside us, at the roots, or as the term would put it, the origins of what we are, a sinful condition. There's a sinfulness about us. We sin because we are sinners. There's a sinnerness with which we come into this world. It's already there. And it's that problem that is being described with the uh, term original sin. Original sin is not a reference directly to the sin committed by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That may be the original human sin in a sense, you know, eating the apple there or whatever fruit it was. But the term is used to describe a condition of sinfulness. And this chapter that we're looking at right now is really intended to give us probably the most definitive treatment of that topic that we find anywhere in the scriptures. So let's, uh, let's read it. We'll take it a paragraph at a time. We'll start at verse 12 and read down to verse 14 and then just work our way through as time permits. So we're in Romans chapter 5 beginning at verse 12. This is the Word of God. Therefore just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, so death spread to all, because all sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. So there's our initial text and you immediately get a sense of the somewhat complex themes that are going to be coursing their way through this text, but let's just have a word of prayer before we get started. Father, we pray that you would give grace to us now as we seek to understand this most important part of the teaching of your scriptures. We pray that you would open our eyes and open our hearts to an understanding and appreciation of these things. And we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, you notice right off the bat, Paul refers to one man. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man. And it's universally understood that the one man that Paul is referring to here is a character that is otherwise known as Adam. And so when we survey the biblical history, we note, of course, that it all begins in a wonderful garden, a kind of paradise. And in that situation, we have Adam, the first man, and Eve, his wife. And Adam, of course, is the representative, in a sense, of the entire human race. All of us, in some sense or other, are present there with him as he's there in the garden. 
And what Paul is alluding to is the fact that Adam sinned. He willingly, knowingly disobeyed God, and so as a result of that act, we could say sin entered the world. Sin entered through that. Now, that in itself would be a catastrophe of incalculable proportions, but of course it doesn't stop there. The fact that Adam sinned gives rise, like a series of dominoes, to a whole lot of consequences. And we begin to see these spelled out. Just as through one man sin entered the world, death came through sin. Now, death came through sin because that's precisely what God had said would take place. God said to Adam, in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. There was a capital punishment that was in the wings on that occasion when Adam decided to disobey God. Now, the full expression of that penalty would have meant Adam died right on the spot. He didn't. Usually we understand that he died in some sense or other, there was some great catastrophe that happened, and yet God, in a sense, gave him a stay of execution. He didn't execute him, but something, cata something catastrophic happened. Some horrible thing happened. And so even though it was not death right now, here and there, just all over, nevertheless, something happened that was going to affect the rest of Adam's existence and certainly the rest of human existence as well. So we have death came, in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. Well, something happened that day, a death of sorts. And then we hear death spread to all. Now, that might be a little bit perplexing. We can understand that Adam would be punished for a sin committed by Adam. That makes sense to us. A person ought to be punished for their own crimes. We have an intuition that that would be the way justice should work its way out, but it's a little bit more difficult to imagine why exactly would it be that death, that same penalty, that same catastrophic consequence would spread to the rest of us. Why am I, in other words, in trouble? Why am I guilty because of a sin that was committed by someone I never met, never chose, uh, have no connection to except that he's my great, 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 you know, however many greats you want to put in there, grandfather way back in the Garden of Eden. And Paul's answer is as elegant as it is mysterious. He says, sin or death spread to all because all sinned. And the clear implication of the language there is that all sinned when Adam sinned. This is not all sinned in the sense that we've all committed sins, which is obviously true. But the point Paul's driving at here, and the grammar of the Greek language makes this abundantly clear, is that we all in some sense participated in that sin committed by Adam. Now, how it is exactly that that participation occurred remains a debated point. And there's a variety of theological theories that are bouncing around out there which propose various explanations for how it was that the sin committed by Adam in the Garden of Eden, you know, however many thousands of years ago that was, somehow was a sin committed by me and you. Paul simply says that's the way it is. And of course that in itself is sufficient for us. The theories suggest things like he was our legal representative, that's called federalism, or that somehow our souls were present in his soul, a kind of traducianism, and various other views. There's one that was called the personal identity theory, championed by a theologian named Jonathan Edwards, and various other theories have been suggested. I'm not going to bother with those right now because it's really beyond the scope of our immediate concern. All I want to do is make sure we all understand that what Paul says here is not so much how it is the case, but simply that it is the case that when Adam sinned, we sinned. We were there, and that's why his consequences of guilt can rightly be my consequences of guilt. And that I'm going to just leave as the end of the conversation, because that's basically the way Paul leaves it. He continues then, sin was indeed in the world before the law. This is a reference to the law coming through Moses. 
sin was in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. There's a function the law has to reveal sin, to measure sin, to quantify it, and to quantify its guilt, and so on. And Paul is saying here, in some sense or other, that that didn't take place before the law came. The law sort of gave a judicial measure of sin. So sin was already in the world, meaning the sin condition, meaning this catastrophic effect of Adam's sin was in the world, but until the law came, it was not measured in a kind of judicial sense. Nevertheless, it was there, and it has continued to be there right down to the present day. He continues, verse 14, Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type, a tupos is the Greek word, a type of the one who was to come. Death exercised dominion. Whatever that means, it's simply to say that death entered the picture with Adam and continued to exercise its dominating force, not only in the life of Adam, but in the life of all of his successors right down to us. There is a sense in which death reigns, death has dominion in this world. And we want to explore that a little bit more in a minute, but I just want to leave it at that for the time being. There's some consequence of death that has entered the picture. Whereas by one man's sin, uh, death spread to all and, and, and has become the problem that we're wrestling with as well. All right. Now, Paul, having said that, wants to set up now the paradigm, you might say, for the other Adam. We have this first Adam that's just been described who was there in the Garden of Eden. And now we have another character who comes along who is also coming in the sort of form of an Adam. And this is the one Paul introduces now in verse 15 and is clearly Christ himself. For the free gift is not like the trespass. We have one Adam who's responsible for a trespass and now a second Adam or a last Adam who comes representing some kind of gift, a free gift. For if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift of grace in the one man Christ abounded to the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of one man's sin, for the judgment followed one trespass bringing condemnation, but the free gift followed many trespasses bringing justification. If because of one man's trespass death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, right, Jesus Christ. complicated uh, paragraph, and I don't have time to go through the details here because there's been literally books written on this, but I want to highlight at least the three little parts of what's going on here that I think are the most important thing for us to take away from a reflection of this paragraph. Notice, first of all, he says the free gift is not like the trespass. So we have, obviously, Paul is setting a, a, a comparison, a contrast and a comparison between two who we know to be the two Adams, if you will. The first Adam there in the Garden of Eden, the last Adam who comes along and becomes the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says three things that sort of form the contrast between these two. So the first of them, if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely the grace of God and the free gift of grace in one man Christ abounded to the many. So notice the first consequence that Paul identifies here, which flows from the fact that Adam sinned, is that the many died. That's a way of saying we all became susceptible to death. Generally, this is regarded as simply a reference to the idea that we all are mortal. The many died. You will die, presumably. I will die. Assuming the Lord doesn't return within our lifetimes, every one of us who is participating in this presentation right now will die. Through medical technology, we might be able to postpone the date of death. We might be able to give ourselves a little more uh, health and time and so on. But eventually, the ravages of death will take over and we will die. And that seems to be the first consequence that flows from the fact that Adam sinned. 
in the day you eat thereof you will surely die. Well, Adam didn't die that day, but he became mortal. He could have died that day, and every day from that point on, for the rest of his hundreds of years of life, could have been his last day. Today could be my last day. After I finish making this presentation, I plan to get in my car and go somewhere, and it's possible I may never get there. I hope I do. I'm trusting God that He'll protect me, but nevertheless, you never know, do you? Because we all are exposed to this problem of being mortal, of, of possibly dying. Now, there's something irregular about that. It's not supposed to be that way, you see. We're not supposed to be in a situation where at any given moment we could drop dead. Mortality represents an invasion of something foreign to the human situation, but it came in as a result of Adam's sin and this whole problem of death, at least in this sense, reigning over us because we have the prospect of death always with us, is one of the first things we notice about the effect of Adam's sin. So that's number one. Number one, we became mortal. The many died. The second problem, the second consequence of Adam's sin is found in verse 16. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin, for the judgment followed one trespass bringing condemnation. But the free gift followed many trespasses bringing justification. The second effect that Paul seems to identify here is wrapped up in this word condemnation. And that's simply a fancy word to say we're guilty. Not only are we susceptible to dying, but on top of that we have an additional problem that we're guilty. If I were to go into a bank, pull out a gun, and grab some money and run, I would be guilty of a crime. The very high likelihood is that I would be captured that I would be tried, that I would be found guilty, and that I would have to pay the debt for the crime that I had committed. Guilt involves some kind of obligation to restore what justice demands. Now what Paul is saying here, don't miss this, is that as a result of the fact that Adam sinned, I am guilty. I am as guilty as if I had committed that sin myself. I know that because what Paul says is that death spread to all because all sinned. When Adam sinned, we all sinned. When Adam did that deed, we all were there. If Adam took a bite of an apple, I tasted its juices. I was there. I sinned. And the sin that I committed has given rise to guilt. And I'm guilty. And I come into this world, Paul is saying here, guilty. Newborn infants are not innocent. They don't come into this world lily white. They come into this world already infected with guilt. They're guilty. They deserve God's punishment from the day they're born. Now that's harsh, I realize, and many people find that an intolerable aspect of Christian teaching and try to find all kinds of ways to avoid it. And I'm simply reporting to you at this point that the universal teaching of the church from her earliest days has taken this point seriously, and Paul certainly at this juncture does not seem to be minimizing the force of this statement whatsoever. As a result of one man's trespass, the many come under condemnation. The many are made guilty and exposed to the wrath of God. So that's effect number two. The third effect that Paul delineates here is in verse 17. If because of one man's trespass, death exercised dominion, also translated death reigned through the one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life. The third negative effect that Paul highlights in this chapter with respect to the sin of Adam is what he says, death had dominion or death reigned. This is probably the most uh, difficult uh, idea. I think it's probably at least intuitively clear what Paul is driving at. When he says death reigned, he's saying that we are in a sense constantly dealing with the fact of our contingency. It's not simply that I might die today, but it's that I have a whole existence that is imperiled. That I am constantly dealing with this overarching 
concern, this overarching problem of my own mortality, my own exposure to death, that there's something deathly within me. I don't know about your experience. I've been impressed many times observing my own culture in which I see what a fascination there is, what a fascination people have with death. And they will do all kinds of things to sort of highlight the, the prospect of death. It's a, an interesting psychological aspect of our life that we have this kind of fixation on death. And people do all sorts of things, sort of day by day, aware of it, lurking in the background. It's always there, haunting our steps. And that problem of death reigning is, at least in some sense or other, what Paul is talking about here. There may be more to it than that, but there's something broken, there's something wrong that seems to be part of what Paul is driving at in this statement. So there's three consequences that result from one man's sin. We all have these problems because of that one sin. And then there's one more that Paul is going to add to the list as we look at it beginning in verse 18. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. The law came in with the result that the trespass multiplied, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that just as sin exercised dominion in death, so grace might exercise dominion through justification leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This last paragraph, you'll notice, adds one more great consequence to the fact that Adam committed this sin. And that's what we find in this little phrase now, verse 19, for just as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, and then it continues with the remedial effects of the work of Christ. The many were made sinners. So the fourth item that Paul puts on his list of effects that flow from the fact that Adam sinned is the many were made sinners. In other words, we come into this world mortal, susceptible to dying. We come into this world in such a way that we're guilty, exposed to the wrath of God. We come in infused with a problem of death reigning over us. This issue of death is constantly with us, dogging our trail, never letting us escape it. And then finally, we're made sinners. We are sinners. We like to sin. We know we shouldn't. We know that we should obey God's law. We know that we should live lives of conformity to the standards of virtue. We know that we should avoid, and yet something in us is drawn to sin. Sin is attractive to us. When we hear that something is wrong, that something is forbidden, we find that we're drawn to it. It's a strange kind of thing. And the tendency we have to sin is one of the most characteristic aspects of our human existence. We are constantly in the battle of resisting the temptation to sin. We were made sin. We come into this world inclined towards sin. Now, how severe that inclination is has been another great debate down through the history of the church. It's called the Pelagian Controversy. It goes back to St. Augustine and the fourth and fifth centuries. I'm not going to get into that right now, but just to remind, just to let you know that that's been a raging debate and whatever the uh, answer may be to that, we'll just have to leave it, that it was serious, that we have been made sinners to a very deep and profound degree, and that that's part of the circumstance in which we find ourselves. Now, in this chapter, you noticed that every negative effect that came as a result of Adam's sin was also parried or answered by a positive effect provided by the last Adam, Christ, who in every case gives the remedy. And though we may find that we are susceptible to mortality, we learn that in Christ there's resurrection. Even though we learn that we're guilty in the first Adam, in the propitiation offered by Christ, you see there's satisfaction of that guilt. Even though death reigns as a result of the first Adam, now there is grace reigning in life 
through Christ, and we have a new life in which we rise above the ravages of death, you see. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? We have a new kind of liberation from that. And finally, even though we were made sinners as a result of the acts of the first Adam, we are made righteous, you see. We have been liberated from sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. Paul is going to tell us in chapter 6. And so in every case, we have a wonderful provision that has been made by Christ to free us from these devastating effects that flow from the uh, results of one man's sin. And some of those effects that we're going to be, begin studying with respect to the work of Christ will be uh, taken up in the very next chapter as we begin to see how the work of Christ is applied to us. And through that, we have this wonderful liberation that Paul wants to describe for us. So we'll uh, end our conversation for now right at this point and uh, look forward to seeing you again. And until then, may God richly bless you.